Um, I have had far fewer cups of coffee than Rodin Genoff has uh, <laughs> this morning, and uh, it's just. Let's just bring it back down a little bit. <laughs> that, was, <laughs> that was very exciting, but you're going to be very disappointed unless uh, expectations are reset. So can I, I begin by uh, acknowledging the Honourable Susan Close, uh, Minister for the Public Sector, but also our Commissioners, uh, Anne Gale and also Irma, and we also have the Chair of uh, Multicultural and Ethnic Affairs um, Committee, the, um, the Honourable Grace Portalesi. Nick Reed's here, the Chief Executive of Bank SA, um, and of course our guest speakers, uh, Narelle and uh, Roden. And a range, and I, I'm very pleased to see the number of men in the room, but also a range of uh, executives uh, from across the whole of the public service, uh, and Renee Hazy, Executive Officer of the Institute of Public Administration. So thank you for being here today. Um, uh, this, uh, that was a fantastic presentation, Roden, and it was very exciting. and. Um, it, it, uh, it is a perspective on, on diversity that uh, I think um, I hadn't really considered in, until I started preparing for this speech. Um, I think traditionally we've seen uh, that the diversity dividend is really just mobilising the talent of, uh, of really you know, that 50% of the population which has traditionally been excluded from, uh, from what we've achieved. I, and I, I, th I suppose in a linear way, we've just thought, well, we're missing out on that. What I think you've introduced to us is the notion that actually it can add more than just the, the talent that's been excluded, it can actually change the whole way in which we operate. And that's obviously very exciting. And I think you've put a, a very um, a challenging but uh, very powerful uh, set of ideas in front of us. Um, it's no... Uh, um, new thing for people here to realise that we're facing many challenging issues in South Australia at the moment. We have uh, an economy which is essentially making the transition from old to new. Uh, and it's been doing that for a long time. It's, it's, it's not true to say that somebody's just woken up and found that out. It's actually been on this journey uh, since Donald Horne wrote his, his famous book Lucky Country in 1964. Progressive public policy intellectuals have realised that Australia and South Australia, uh, in particular, can couldn't just be a, a farm or a quarry. It, it had to diversify its economy. It really started with uh, with um, Sir Thomas Playford behind uh, large tariff walls, but uh, industrialising at uh, South Australia. But really, it was it was the diversification to other areas of the economy which started to accelerate under Don Dunstan and then really has progressed through the whole of the period to this day uh, where we're seeking to find new ways of doing things uh, and diversifying the base of our the South Australian economy. The truth now is though that the largest single, um, if you like, archaeological relic of the old economy, which is the car industry, which has sustained such a large part of the South Australian economy is about to disappear in a couple of years' time. And that is going to be a massive challenge for, this, for the South Australian economy. But um, we're well placed to, to, to meet that challenge because we have been, over that period of time, been growing a very diverse and exciting economy. There is the skills, the capacity, the talent, uh, and the understanding of the challenge to allow us to make that great leap uh, into the new economy. Um, and um, I think the, the, the wonderful thing about that is that we could be um, an international example on the front page of uh, The Economist about how uh, an economy actually made that transition from the old economy to the new economy. We, we could do this in South Australia and we could be the international case study that uh, gets lectured at in the Harvard, Harvard Business Schools about how a state uh, was able to see something coming and make the necessary adjustments and consume that change and emerge out the other end uh, more strongly than it, uh, it went into that challenge. So that's, the, that's the, uh, the burning platform, as they say, which is in front of us. And um, it's an exciting discussion that uh, we're now involved in. Of course, it's nerve-wracking if you're the person that's associated 
that's directly affected by those changes. Uh, but uh, for some of us that have the, the capacity and the, and the responsibility to uh, navigate the state through those changes, uh, it's an exciting challenge and, and we should uh, accept it with relish and apply ourselves creatively uh, to, the, to the challenge that, that's in front of us. Today is an opportunity to do that. So in this environment, we're naturally seeking to take advantage of every opportunity that's available to us, interrogate every resource which is underutilised. And that's what we've been doing in South Australia. Uh, whether it's our natural resources, all the way through to our human resources, we need to think carefully about ways in which we can uh, do new things in new ways, which is essentially the meaning of, of innovation. Um, and of course, uh, I don't think South Australia can truly achieve its potential without the full and free participation of women in our society. And um, it's, it's not enough for women to, to simply uh, be represented in proportion with their representation in the communities, as important as that is. Um, and, is, and, and we've made some important uh, strides in that regard. Uh, you've, you've just heard the, the substantial increase in the number of women that are represented in the, in the senior executive services. A and, and I'm also proud to say that we have about 48% of women that are represented on our boards and committees in state government, something we have direct control over. And 40% uh, of women chair those committees, which uh, exceeds any private sector comparator and I think any other state or territory. So we are um, making some headway, but it's not enough simply to have women uh, who are represented uh, in our institutions. It's also the quality of uh, the way in which they can participate. Uh, and uh, in this regard, uh, we, uh, it's impossible to discuss uh, the, the role of women without really discussing a difficult issue and that's uh, the question of violence against women in our community. Uh, the truth is that uh, too many women feel that their options are constrained because uh, they experience uh, violence at the hands of men. And um, while women can play some role in this, fundamentally uh, this is a men's issue. Women can seek to protect themselves, they can seek to, uh, to um, challenge this behaviour. But fundamentally, change will only occur if men change their behaviour. And the, the change in behaviour is simply, is more than just um, wagging your finger at men and saying, don't hit women. It's, it's actually springs from a continuum of violence which starts with discrimination, essentially disrespect. And uh, this is something that uh, we have put very firmly on the, the state agenda and, and I'm pleased to say has been put very firmly on the national agenda by the Prime Minister. And at the, at the conference uh, uh, that uh, was held recently in, in Sydney, the, the retreat and then the, the subsequent COAG meeting, uh, we made some powerful commitments uh, as national leaders, state and territory governments and the Prime Minister about this question of violence against women. We've committed ourselves together for a national awareness campaign and we're interrogating all of the, uh, the measures that are being taken around the nation to grapple with this, um, uh, this fundamental issue. Uh, South Australia, I'm pleased to say, has been uh, noticed by Rosie Batty, who is Australian of the Year and is leading this push and as a key advisor to the Prime Minister, has, been, um, has recognised South Australia as a leader in this field. I'm very proud to say that on the National Advisory Committee to the Prime Minister we have Maria Hadjius, who is a, a well-known South Australian uh, leader in the domestic violence sector. Uh, so South Australia should be proud of the role that it is playing in this leadership on this question of violence against women. But it fundamentally comes back to the, the, the role of men in our community and fundamentally uh, how men see themselves and the way in which they relate to the world around them. Um, and it's, I think this is not unrelated to the questions of leadership which are at the heart of unlocking the new models uh, of management that need to occur not just in business but also across uh, our important public sector. And this is where, this is where real innovation can occur. Um, it's, it's, 
that the notion of moving away from a command and control styles of leadership, which very much reflect uh, command and control modes of thinking, uh, which are at the heart of the conception that many uh, men have of themselves. Um, many men have been brought up thinking that they have to be in control of everything around them for them to be men. That's how they see their role. Uh, they see uh, the importance of controlling their emotions, they see the importance of controlling the way in which other people interact with them, and in doing so they constrain the choices and options of people around them. And this is, this is a short step to the sort of disrespect uh, which we see in the relationship between men and women. It's a short step, uh, sadly, to uh, violence that also flows from, from this conception that men have of themselves. So this is a very powerful opportunity for us to rethink men's role in the community and men's role in leadership uh, and, of course, the way in which that allows other people to, to, to participate around them, not just women, but other men, and how they can get into the conversation about uh, new ideas. What we want to do is to unlock the talents and creativity of more citizens, men and women, so that they can contribute to the challenges that face us here in South Australia. Um, now, we've... Uh, we're doing some very important things uh, in South Australia in this regard. Uh, and um, just uh, last evening, uh, we made uh, some important uh, announcements uh, through the Minister for the Status of Women. And she has um, uh, committed herself to a policy which uh, is about um, achieving equality for women in the South Australian community. The South Australian Women's Policy uh, which has recently been uh, put on the website for the Office for Women, is really designed with state government agencies in mind and to provide them with a framework which allows them to foster gender equality, both in their own work but also in partnerships that they forge with business and community. The three pillars of the policy are boosting the economic status of women, increasing women's leadership and participation and improving women's safety and well-being. Uh, and uh, this builds on uh, the policy announcement that we made in this important area of violence against women. Uh, last year, through a Taking a Stand initiative, uh, I committed the state government agencies to becoming white ribbon accredited workplaces in recognition that violence against women has an impact on their health, safety, well-being and productivity at work. Uh, all 11 agencies currently participating in the accreditation process have completed step one and we expect them to complete the second and final step by July 2016. Um, and I'm very pleased to say that uh, this level of commitment from state government agencies is, uh, I think, a powerful and important step. We are a very substantial employer. We employ uh, a very significant proportion of the South Australian workforce. Uh, and the truth is there will, be, um, there will be the victims of domestic violence and also the perpetrators of domestic violence that exist within our services. And so we need to take a leadership role. Um, we also need to know that, that people will be coming to work um, having to grapple with the living and working, uh, bearing the burdens of these things. And so it's incredibly important that we have the policies and practices in place that are prepared to respond to these issues. So um, this is an incredibly powerful and important conference. Uh, what Roden has introduced us to, the notion of innovation being driven by diversity, gender diversity, ethnic diversity, is a very powerful idea. It speaks, um, I think, to a, a South Australian strength. Uh, this has been something that we've been very proud of, our leadership in both of these areas. Um, we're seeking to deepen um, our understanding uh, and our willingness to embrace diversity in all its forms in South Australia. We believe that connects us uh, to all of the talent that exists in South Australia and to the world in a way which can only allow South Australia to prosper. So thank you all so much for being here. This. I think could be um, one of the most important meetings that you've attended in recent times and I hope from here 
uh, we can um, uh, take many of the bold steps that Roden has invited us to take. Thank you. I was really struck by your comments about the command and control constraints and how that constrains us. And I guess I wonder what for um, your insights on if we've been operating that way for a period <coughs> of time, it's quite difficult to move our headspace or reset our mindsets, to use Roden's phrase. What insights could you offer about how we might go about that? Um, well, I think um, uh, men need to talk to other men about that. Um, and uh, I think um, so men in leadership roles need to, well, to ask themselves some of these questions and, and then also talk to other men about these, these issues. Um, uh, I, I think it would be a great relief uh, for many men to think that they don't have to behave in a certain way. So I don't think this is just an issue about the well-being of women. I think it's also an issue about uh, men and, and their health and well-being. It, it strikes me as a really fundamental issue mm. in all of this. It is. Well. I mean, yeah. it's, I mean, it, we had an interesting conversation at COAG uh, with uh, some sort of, in inverted commas, old-fashioned men <laughs> uh, about this question, uh, where they sort of asked, sort of, oh, you know, surely you can still be an old-fashioned man and not hit women. And I said, I'm sure you can. But, um, but I think, you know, this is a much deeper, it's a much deeper issue and you have to ask yourself what's, what lies behind some of these, um, these thoughts and feelings mm -hmm. which ultimately turn into actions. Mm -hmm. I wanted to, to just briefly broaden that now and, and Australia's, South Australia's been a leader. Um, bold policy over the years. How important is that now, given the challenges that we've got and the very, and, and we often forget, we think of the challenges, but we forget the massive opportunities given this yeah. change to, to be on that international forefront. I mean, look, it's, a, it's an increasingly sort of crowded international marketplace where everybody's trying to grab attention. And, and you do have to stand out if you want to attract um, if you want to attract attention, I mean, you need awareness before you can get preference. That's a basic marketing principle. So we, we need to create awareness of South Australia. To do that, mm -hmm. uh, we think we do need to be a leader. I mean, we're, we're 1.7 million people mm. with a million hectares uh, in a country of 22 million. I mean, we need to look beyond our borders for, for investment and for markets. So that involves our reputation our reputation is important, uh, and we can gain a strong reputation for leadership. Um, and you know, we also know the size size of the problem and the urgency of the problem is is there. Everybody knows what that is. Uh, so we we need. Um, so I think to quote, quote um, sort of uh, Horatio Nelson, the the boldest measures are the safest. <laughs> <laughs> it's very very. Very apt, and the status quo is uh, is is death, yes. a, a, according to another less famous <laughs> uh, warmonger, <laughs> uh, not warmonger, really. Uh, what um, now? So it's 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 the things we do every day. It's those steps we take. The what I what I say, how I act, what I prioritise, and how I measure is, is one framework I think about. So what might be one or two practical things? You've mentioned having a conversation, mm. but each of us that we could take out of this room today that might um, ignite that. <laughs> there was a business leader that uh, once said to me that he, when he prepares a meeting, he, he has, he calls the four P's. He said, you know, practical sort of issues like are the uh, AV equipment working on and all the rest of it, uh, are the, um, you know, the purpose of the meeting, uh, the product, you know, is there, do you have a draft of the product? Finally, the last question he asked is P, the people, the right people around the room. So it seems to me you should always be asking, you know, um, is it, are the right people sitting in the room? And part of that question could include uh, where are the women? Mm. Uh, if there aren't enough women or if or there's no other, there's no diversity if, if the question demands that question, that, that issue. So I think, you know, business managers when they're constructed, we, we do a lot of meetings. Mm. <laughs> I suspect in the public service, and some of them I think just happen. Um, 
I think we need to attend a bit more thoughtfully about meetings and who's, who's at the table and who's not at the table. Mm. When you caught up with the process, it's the outcomes of that that we, we sometimes lose sight of. Mm. I guess. And, and speaking of meetings, it's coming up to 10 o'clock. We have the premiere for, for this um, precious window. I really appreciate your thought and your contribution to this and your energy. Thank you and very much. And please put your hands together and thank you very much.